Hi, Chris Cox, thoracic radiologist at Creighton University. And for this session, we'll be talking about basics of thoracic trauma on chest CT. Generally, in the setting of trauma, uh, the study will be ordered as a chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And I put CTA here because the chest is generally obtained in a uh, late systemic arterial phase for evaluation of the aorta, with the abdomen and pelvis generally obtained in a portal venous phase for evaluation of solid uh, organ injury. Also for this talk, I'm focusing on blunt trauma, such as motor vehicle accident, as opposed to penetrating trauma, such as a gunshot wound. For assessing the chest for trauma, basically it is an anatomic review with an expectation that any structure in the chest could be injured. So it's uh, you have to have a high level of clinical suspicion that something is wrong and really be meticulous in your anatomic survey. <clears throat> that said, for this, I'm going to be showing some of the more common manifestations of trauma as well as some critical <clears throat> uh, injuries that can occur in the chest. So acute traumatic aortic injury, pulmonary contusion and laceration, pneumothorax, soft tissue hematoma, particularly assessing for active hemorrhage, rib fractures, and spinal fractures. <clears throat> this is an example of acute traumatic aortic injury, and what's important to remember in the setting of trauma is that it is not the same as an evaluation for aortic dissection. Any abnormality in the wall of the aorta in the setting of trauma is uh, concerning for acute traumatic aortic injury and with a high morbidity and mortality and uh, likely surgical treatment. This is an example of an injury to the aorta at the distal aortic arch and proximal descending aorta at the level of the ligamentum arteriosum, which is a common location because of its tether point the ascending aorta is a common location for, a, for traumatic injury, but because of the high mortality, we often, the patient doesn't uh, often get to the scanner uh, due to fatality. Another common location is the tether point at the uh, diaphragm at the aortic hiatus. In terms of the lungs, uh, pulmonary contusion manifests as areas of pulmonary consolidation. And it's not so much that this is uh, a finding that needs to be addressed, but it is uh, an indicator to look for injuries in the adjacent soft tissues. Also, there are other causes of consolidation in the setting of trauma, for instance, aspiration that could cause bibasilar consolidations. So the distribution of the consolidations can also help in uh, assessing for whether it's contusion uh, versus an alternative etiology. Laceration, on the other hand, will cause discontinuity in the pulmonary parenchyma which opens it up and creates cystic spaces that are generally air and fluid filled. And this is a, a nice example here because it shows the associated consolidations which are typically seen in the setting of pulmonary laceration. So you've got the contusions of consolidation and then these multifocal cystic areas from pulmonary laceration. Pneumothorax is also a common finding in the setting of uh, trauma, and it will commonly be associated with either a chest wall defect, uh, such as rib fractures, or uh, an injury to the lung or airway. And both of those are commonly associated with air getting to other spaces in the chest, whether it's pneumomediastinum or chest wall emphysema. Here we've got primarily uh, a pneumothorax. It's probably about moderate in size considering that this is a uh, coronal image. Uh, 
and that pneumothorax is preferentially going to be uh, anteriorly distributed in a patient who's supine. We also see here patchy consolidation in the left upper lobe from pulmonary uh, contusions. In this patient, uh, it's a nice example of chest wall injury, not just because it has a thickening of the soft tissues associated with hematoma and scattered areas of air from uh, soft tissue emphysema, but also you'll notice this focal area of high density centrally within the hematoma. <clears throat> And in the setting of trauma, this is highly concerning for active hemorrhage. Often you'll see this associated, say, with a rib fracture with an intercostal artery that is uh, actively bleeding. And maybe the, fact, maybe the case here is we do see some high uh, attenuation deep to a couple of the posterolateral right ribs that could also be sites of uh, active hemorrhage. And may need to uh, be treated uh, by interventional radiology to stop the bleeding. In the setting of trauma, you have to go through every single rib and assess it for either cortical discontinuity or cortical irregularities such as a buckle in the, in the cortex to indicate that there are rib fractures. If you've got multiple fractures at multiple levels, say, you know, two fractures and three consecutive ribs, then we're talking about uh, a flail chest. And that's important to note because uh, it changes the dynamics of uh, respiration so that your, your uh, chest wall does not have the rigidity to create that negative pressure and actually sucks in at the site of the rib fractures. Uh, so the mechanics of breathing are compromised. Also for this one, you'll notice that they have soft tissue thickening and actually high density hematoma lateral to that rib fracture. And then the second image is showing with these areas a focus of high density from active hemorrhage into the chest wall. Again, something that would need to be uh, addressed acutely. And then finally, uh, spine fractures. Most commonly uh, for the thoracic spine, they're going to be compression fractures. So you're really looking for kind of that wedge deformity at any level of the thoracic spine. It's not uncommon to have chronic anterior wedging in the vertebral bodies. So you're looking for one that uh, looks particularly different than, than the others. You're looking for areas of uh, cortical discontinuity to tell you that you've got a, an actual fracture there. <clears throat> and then also, once you recognize that there is a vertebral body fracture, then you're going to want to look across the entire uh, vertebral body at that level, or the ver vertebrae at that level. And here we see in the posterior elements a distraction injury. So they've fra they've anteriorly compressed it, but they've posteriorly distracted. So this is a three column injury and an unstable injury of the thoracic spine uh, in this patient. There's uh, a lot of different ways that uh, fractures can manifest in the thoracic spine. So this isn't the only uh, appearance of uh, spinal fractures, but this is a uh, common one that has associated with it the posterior element fractures that are concerning, that uh, indicate instability. And finally, I just want to drive home the point, and as you've seen on these prior examples, that these traumatic injuries travel in packs, right? You injure an area as opposed to an anatomic structure, right? So it's not that you injure the lung or you injure the rib, it's that the you injure the chest wall and the lung altogether, and it creates a, a collection of 
injuries. So once you see one, then that's a, a good indicator to be looking for uh, adjacent injuries as well as classic uh, associated injuries. For instance, in that anterior wedge compression of the uh, mid to upper thoracic spine, that's commonly associated with a uh, sternal fracture. So once you see a sternal fracture, then you're going to want to look closely at that uh, mid to upper thoracic spine. So that's the whirlwind of traumatic injuries of the chest. Great job.